Thanks very much for the introduction. And uh, I'm deeply grateful to this whole community um, for lots of reasons, as I'll go into later. But um, I'm especially grateful to the nominators and this committee, the House committee, and to Dr. Howe's family for this kind of honor. It's pretty rare that you get acknowledged for your scientific endeavors and your service work at the same time. So that's, that's very special to me, um, because that stuff's very important. OK, so I changed my title just a little bit because um, I I'd normally talk with this group about the changes I'm trying to make in density functional theory to make it more useful for something called warm dense matter. Um, but a lot of the work that I do is in the formalism of density functional theory. And so in reality, I'm hoping to improve uh, density functional theory in general um, and make it uh, more widely applicable. So um, before I do that, though, I want to acknowledge all of the people that have worked on the, um, the projects that I'm going to talk about today. I'm going to be talking about a lot of my graduate work and its extensions, because I think that's what this community would be most interested in. And um, among the people, uh, the people in bold here are the ones that have worked with me on, uh, on these projects. Um, as we've talked about already today, and as most of you are aware, none of our work happens in a vacuum or as solitary. Um, endeavors. So um, I'm also, of course, grateful for all of the funding and institutional support I've had um, throughout grad school and uh, now in my postdoc um, from U University of California, Irvine, University of California, Berkeley, and especially Lawrence Livermore National Lab, which is where I am now. And um, I'm, of course, grateful to the Krell Institute for all of the support and community that they've created um, for all of us and our benefit. So I'm going to talk a little bit about what warm dense matter is, because most people, unless they've seen me talk here before um, or are working on it themselves, aren't aware of what warm dense matter refers to. Um, the, one of the areas that warm dense matter occurs that's most interesting to the Department of Energy and to Lawrence Livermore in particular um, is inertial confinement fusion. So um, it, this is a diagram that talk, is a cartoon of what happens. So there are these different stages. And you usually start with a, a frozen deuterium or tritium fuel cell that's covered in something like a plastic or carbon. And uh, you radiate that with x-rays. And as that shell heats up, in the second uh, image here, you see that it's getting hot. And eventually, it blasts off like a rocket. Woo! So it blasts off and then it condenses down the inner center um, so that it becomes very, very dense. And then it implodes and it releases clean, bountiful energy. And everybody's happy and we never have to worry about anything again. Um, so this is really hard, right? This is, a, this is a hard thing and there's lots of money spent on trying to make this happen in a lot of different organizations. Um, at Lawrence Livermore, the National Ignition Facility is one of those places. And so um, that's why I have the postdoc that I have is because they work a lot on this problem um, from an experimental standpoint and from a theoretical standpoint. Um, as you go from cold, icy things to hot, hot stuff, you pass through warm stuff. OK, warm is, is a relative term. In physics, warm means something different than it does to a chemist like me. Um, so warm, dense matter happens on the path to ignition of inertial confinement fusion. That's a really hard thing to do, as I said before. And these experimental facilities are massive um, for creating it. But you also find it um, in the universe sitting there with very little effort at all from people. And that's in warm planetary cores. And so again, warm, dense planetary cores, I'm going to talk about those in terms of actual numbers in a little bit, what warm means. But here, this is something from some promotional materials from Stanford because they have one of those experimental facilities. And you can see that I think this is supposed to be Jupiter from the wavy brown chocolate vanilla caramel ice cream outside of it. I'm guessing they mean Jupiter, but I'm not really sure. But as, as you have these really, really big planets, you get all really, really dense stuff on the inside. And you also have high temperatures. And there you find things that are at these very high temperature, high pressure phases. Um, so you find warm dense matter there as well. You also find it inside the Earth um, or on the surface of the sun, not inside the sun. That's too hot. Um, so I talked about big experimental facilities. So NIF is here on the left. And then this is the Z machine at Sandia, New Mexico, which is where I did my practicum. So whoop, whoop. Um, so <laughs> that's, uh, I was right next door to it. So I get to feel the building shake and stuff when, it would, when they would hit the button. This is um, at Lawrence Berkeley. This is the advanced light source. And then this is uh, the Omega laser at Rochester. Um, so there are, lots, there are very different ways that you can create these high energy situations, high temperature, high pressure, where you both get temperature effects and um, quantum effects from having things squished together so closely. Um, so this is some research that was done at NIF, not my own. Um, you can tell because it has experiments in it, and I don't know anything about that. So experimental probes of planetary conditions refers to the fact that here we have um, 
units of Earth radii on one side and Earth mass on the x-axis here. Um, and really what you can think of this as is a, a phase diagram. So you can see here that we have things like Neptune, Uranus, um, Saturn, and Jupiter. So they're able to probe certain planetary conditions um, or get close to them. And that's what I'm going to look at when I zoom in here on that little corner. Um, I like these units better because I'm not um, an astro person. So we have density on the x-axis and pressure on the y-axis now. And that's th those are things I can, I can conceptualize better. And if you look at this shaded part on the top of this graph, that's the Jovian core. So that's, those are conditions that you might find in the center of Jupiter. And if you look at the blue curve here, that's what's experimentally accessible through NIF. So that's, that's, that's a pretty big deal. That's a big facility, um, you know, a flagship facility big world-class thing, right? And you see it just starts to tip into that um, high pressure, high density region. And you see that they're using these other curves to, to go up there, and there's a big range in between all of those. Those are all different theoretical methods. Um, some of them are density functional theory without temperature effects. Some of them have the temperature effects put in in a different way. But you can see that once you get past where we have experimental data to verify it, you have a wide range of behavior there. And we don't know, without experimental access into that region, we don't know which one of those to pick. So um, this becomes a problem. And the reason there's so much range there is because this is called the malfunction junction by some of the theorists that work on it. Um, and so the malfunction junction refers to the fact that maybe you're a plasma physicist, a plasma theorist, and you work up in very high temperature, hot matter, maybe even hot, dense matter. But as you cool that stuff down, your methods might stop working. And actually, they do usually stop working as you hit warm, dense matter. Similarly, if you come from cold, chilly quantum land, like I do, um, and you heat things up, your methods start becoming more and more expensive or not including the temperature effects that are important. So warm, dense matter exists in this troublesome regime where you have um, gas, liquids, and solids all close by and plasmas uh, bordering it as well. So not only do we have methods that don't work as you stretch into this complicated regime, you also need to do things like working on big problems like inertial confinement fusion, where you're stretching through cold condensed matter all the way up into plasmas. And so you need to be able to not only um, have reliable calculations for warm dense matter, but also have methods that can get cooled off or heated up and stretch across um, wildly divergent phase regimes. So that's, that's a hard problem. Um, the reason why these simulations are so important, as I said before, is because we can't even access some of the experimental regimes that we would like to be able to access. When we can't access them, they're really, really expensive, and sometimes it's even hard to analyze the results that come out, especially if you don't have reliable theoretical methods. So the theoretical methods need to deal with all kinds of complicated effects. Strong correlation is something that somebody talked about earlier, right? Um, and you also have things like temperature effects and um, quantum, quantum mechanical effects beyond strong correlation. Um, and sometimes you even need to get response properties. So response properties are like, I do, it, I do a thing to this material and it responds to me. So maybe that's shining a laser on it, maybe it's smashing it um, and having it have some sort of nonlinear effects. Time dependence. All of these things are inaccessible using the methods that people generally use um, for solving these problems normally. You need to use them not only for um, predicting what will happen from an experiment, but for designing the experiments themselves and for interpreting the data that comes out of them. So one of the ways that people work on these things is quantum molecular dynamics. This takes some quantum mechanical method and couples it to a classical mechanics method. So you have ions, the atomic centers in these materials that are dealt with using Newtonian mechanics, which is just F equals MA. I push it, it does stuff that makes sense to me as a human being walking around in the world. And I tie that, I freeze those atoms, atomic centers down, and then I will use that as an external potential to solve a quantum mechanical problem that tells me about the behavior of the electrons. Once I do that, I stop that, and then I say, well, what, what forces would be pushing from those electrons on the ions themselves? So then I go back to the ions and I say, hey, these are the electronic fo forces. I push them for one time step, stop things, use the new potential to solve a quantum mechanical problem again. So this goes back and forth, this iterative thing, and it's very, very expensive, especially as you get to higher and higher temperatures. The temperatures that we're looking at here are thousands to millions of Kelvin, so that, and solid densities to 10 times solid densities. So you have an enormous number of states that are occupied. So you have these massive, massive eigensystem solves that you have to do at each time step. Um, because that's so expensive, um, 
you have to figure out clever ways to deal with that. Um, and then beyond that, even if you're clever, you still need massive um, computational resources. Um, you also, as I mentioned before, we need to have response properties for a lot of these things. And for that, you need time dependence on top of the temperature dependence, quantum mechanical and classical mechanical behavior. Um, and furthermore, since we're doing the stitching together of classical and quantum effects, we're stopping time and we're preventing energy transfer between the ions and the electrons. And you can imagine that if you're smashing these things together and having them at these very high temperatures and pressures, that you're going to have energy that's that in a real system would be transferring from one or the other. In certain regimes, you can assume that there's not a lot of transfer, but as you move across that huge phase diagram, you're going to need to be able to talk about energy transfer at some point. So um, what I'm going to do is talk about um, how you can use different methods to improve the quantum part of that quantum molecular dynamics methodology. Most of the most successful ways of using quantum molecular dynamics right now use density functional theory, which is a way of solving the quantum mechanical electronic problem. So I'll introduce that here, and then um, I'll talk about some of the ways that I've been working on improving that for these high temperature, high density systems. And um, I'll also talk about an alternative that I've proposed for the quantum mechanical step in those quantum molecular dynamics simulations. So the Holmberg cone theorem, some, we've already heard a little bit about DFT, so I'm not gonna go that far into it here. And you don't really need to know that much about DFT to understand that I'm doing some weird math stuff. You guys all like weird math stuff. So um, <laughs> I'll, do, I'll do brief things. If you have more questions afterwards, we can talk about it. But Holmberg cone is the big theorem of DFT. Um, and it tells you that there's a one-to-one -one correspondence between the potential and the electronic density. So here on the left is the set of all potentials. In the middle is the set of all wave functions. And on the right here is the set of all electronic densities. What this tells me is that if I know something about my system, so I say, I would like to solve this quantum mechanical system, the way that you identify that is by saying, what is your external potential? If I know that, um, I'm automatically going to get a single electronic density out of that and vice versa, that I can go back and forth. So if I know the electronic density, I'll also know what the potential is. That's a really big deal, and people didn't know that until 1964 when they wrote down this relatively simple proof that tells us something very important. The next part of this, this paper that was really important is that, it, that you know that the energy, the ground state energy, the um, lowest energy state of a quantum mechanical system is a functional of the density. That means if you give me an electronic density, you say, okay, across all space, I know that the probability of finding an electron is right here and right here. I'm gonna say that it's five here and seven here, right? Okay, you have some, some number um, and as a function of R. And if you know that, then you automatically know what the ground state energy is of that system. That's a really big deal, and that reduces the computational cost that we heard about earlier down from a 3n problem to a, a three-dimensional problem. So that's a pretty important thing, but the way that most people do density functional theory now is using um, the cone sham formalism. And so here, what that means is that you're mapping from an inner, uh, you have this interacting system that you actually want to solve, but you can solve it using the non-interacting system. So, um, the way that you do that is by having those non-interacting electrons sit in a different effective potential that sort of wraps up all of the real quantum mechanical effects. So now I don't even need to solve a coupled, different, a coupled equation. I can just solve these one particle equations. So what we have here is just a simple example. This is the radial electronic density on the top here in blue for the helium atom. Um, and you can see that the actual potential for a real helium atom plotted 1D with Mathematica, obviously very, very realistic. This here, um, this, this red curve is the actual potential that it would be sitting in. If I use cone sham density functional theory, I'm going to get the same density out because I want that ground state energy. That's what I care about. And by the Holmberg cone theorem, I know that all I need for that is the density. I don't, I don't need the potential to be right to get that. I just need the density to be right. So I'm going to mess with my potential until I get this yellow curve here. And if I mess with my potential, I can get the density to be the same for a bunch of non-interacting electrons. So what I end up having is the same density but different potentials coming out. And then if I approximate cone sham theory, which is what we were talking about earlier, I get a totally different curve. But it doesn't matter. Why? Because the density is the same. The density is the only thing I need to get the ground state energy right. That's awesome. Okay, so Cone and Sham did that for Cone and Sham did that for zero temperature systems. Merman did that at the same time for finite temperature systems. Um, 
he set up a way of doing the Holmberg cone theorem saying that you, all, you can do this whole density functional theory um, system for finite temperature electronic systems. So that means that I can look at a non, uh, an interacting system of interest that's at finite temperature. Finite temperature just means it's hot. It's not zero temperature because um, it's talking about inverse temperature, but it's annoying sometimes because people say, well, if it's zero temperature, finite temperature, but it's inverse. Okay, finite temperature means thermal. If I have a thermal ensemble of states, then I can take that and I can map that onto a non-interacting system again. But what I'm going to get out are free energies or grand potentials instead of ground state energies. So it's an ensemble free energy that I'm interested in. So that means that people are allowed to use finite temperature cone sham in order to solve these warm dense matter systems and plug it into that quantum molecular dynamics back and forth between ions and electrons. However, this is, as I said before, it's really, really expensive. And it's because this yellow DFT step here ends up being um, the most expensive part of that because you have to solve the cone sham equations, which is that giant eigen system solve that you need for a massive number of occupied states because they're partially occupied up to some very high energy. Um, so the way that we could go around that is by using the substitution that I propose later um, for, going, uh, for getting out of cone sham DFT at finite temperature. The other thing that is a problem is that if we're using this DFT step, we know that we need some effective potential that those non-interacting electrons are sitting in. If we don't have temperature dependence built into our system, then we don't have any way to get the accurate effective potential back out. We know that that's a shortcoming, but it's worked very well so far. And part of the problem is that we don't know why it works so well. And the other part of the problem is that because we can't access experimental data up that, at those high temperature and high pressure conditions, we don't really know how well it's working. It works well enough that people keep doing it, but we know that it's not, it's not accurate um, formally. So um, a lot of my work is also figuring out how to put in those finite temperature um, dependencies into the approximations that you use in DFT. So um, here are the ways that I think DFT can be improved for warm, dense matter. Um, the first one is putting in those time-dependent approximations. The next is figuring out how to do those response properties. So not only do you need temperature dependence, you also need that time dependence in order to get um, the response properties that you would get when, say, you shine a laser on warm dense matter to do diagnostics on your experiment. Um, so we need a way to do that that's rigorous and reliable. The final path that I focus on is looking at improving the computational efficiency. I'm going to do a thing where I, in this talk, I sort of group the first two together, um, and then I'll talk about the third path at the end. So building temperature-dependent DFT approximations using time-dependent density functional theory is something that we published pretty recently um, and is sort of the tail end of my graduate work. Um, and so what this is is a way to use formalism that we developed with a new proof in order to extract some temperature dependence that's not currently um, it's not currently uh, contained in the way people do finite temperature density functional theory. So scaling in density functional theory refers to um, scaling coordinates um, while keeping your density normalized. And what you can do, this, this seems very removed from the reality of actually constructing approximations, but what it lets you do is see what happens to energy components as you stretch or squeeze the density. We know how this is supposed to behave for the exact system. But, even, but, but not all approximations are going to behave the same way. So what we can do is use this as a tool to figure out whether or not um, certain approximations work well in this way. It also allows us, as I'll show later, to cobble together from this behavior new approximations or new pieces of temperature dependence. So this is coordinate scaling. Um, and you can see that um, the, the red curve could be our original density. Um, original electronic density, and as we, as we stretch things out um, and go to the blue dotted line, which is probably kind of hard to see here, we still have the same number of electrons by looking at the integrated area under that curve, and as we squeeze it, we still have the same area because um, it squishes up in the middle. So this is just, when I talk about coordinate scaling, this is all I'm talking about doing. Um, if we talk about temperature scaling, all we're doing is heating things up. These are non-interacting electrons sitting in a part in an infinitely walled box. This is the easiest stuff that you can imagine with um, quantum mechanics. This is stuff that 
people way smarter than me cut their teeth on in quantum mechanics class, right? So this is, this, I've published this. That's the other thing, right? So it's like very simple stuff, but it's important because this, this is, these non-interacting electrons are representative of that cone sham system. And even if all you do is heat them up, they have this very different behavior. And you can see that as if you start with the tepid, cool, electrons in the blue curve and you heat it up, you have that density smearing out towards the edges of the box. That kind of behavior is going to be present whether or not your electrons are interacting. And you can imagine that this is related to the smearing out of the electronic density here in the coordinates, that we might be able to write a smeared out density that's coming from just stretching or squeezing things in terms of heating or cooling things off. And that's exactly what happens. The other thing that's interesting if you're looking at something like density functional theory is that you can turn a knob call, uh, called the interaction strength or the coupling constant that moves you from the red curve here all the way to the yellow curve here. So it's moving you from the interacting system down to the non-interacting system while holding the density constant. So you can think of it as just a knob that at zero, you have no interaction in the cone sham system. And as you crank that knob to one, you get the interacting system of the, of the electrons that you actually care about. So that's something that we can also scale. We can say, oh, I'm going to have half the real interaction. or I'm going to have a quarter of the real interaction. That's also going to determine how spread out and how much your density is interacting with itself. So, if you tie all of that coordinate interaction and temperature scaling together, what you can do is take some pieces that have already been derived, um, like this first thing, which is called the finite temperature adiabatic connection formula, which is just saying, if I use that knob that goes from zero to one to move from the non-interacting system to the interacting system, I can actually write down um, an important part of the interaction energy called the correlation free energy. Um, I can write that down in terms of just the potential contribution of that alone. That means I don't have to deal with entropy. Everyone knows entropy is messy. Nobody wants to deal with entropy. So if I, all I need is a potential, then I can take that dial and use that to, con to um, construct correlation energies just from what is easier to understand. So I can take that and I can mix it up with that tied coupling constant coordinate and temperature scaling that I was talking about before in the previous slides, which is talked about here, which says if I scale the density in a certain way and scale the temperature in a certain way, there is a proportional relationship between that new exchange correlation free energy and the old one. Again, that doesn't seem like it's very helpful for constructing new things, but I can see a way to pull information out of one of those things and construct a new approximation that has temperature dependence in it. So if I do all that and sort of blend it up in a blender, I can do a change of variables and I can get something called the thermal connection formula. What this does is it allows me to pull out free energies, which are complicated with entropy and uh, kinetic energy and potential energy all together. I can get that complicated object simply by using the potential contribution to that piece and scaling it and squishing it and squeezing it. That's, and turning that knob, you have to have the knob. If you don't have the knob, you can't do it. So here the knob is temperature instead of interaction strength. So, in the adiabatic connection formula at the top, I needed to know the value of that potential at all different values of interaction. That's a very hard thing to do in a lot of situations where you don't know the complicated behavior ahead of time. A lot of the time, your temperature dependence is much simpler because you're building it yourself and you don't know how complicated it really should be. But what that means is that if you have some good model for the exchange correlation potential that depends on temperature, you can use this machinery to extract something that's even more complicated. So you get a, a consistent approximation to the free energy from the potential energy. Okay, I'm almost done with the equations and I'll go back to pictures. So then um, the thermal connection formula can do all of this stuff that's written down here. But really the main thing is it connects density functional theory to plasma theory, which is important because these different communities are trying to talk to each other all the time now because they're trying to deal with warm, dense matter. By being able to use a temperature integral, you can talk about low temperature behavior and very high temperature, high density behavior at the same time. That's an important communication piece, which is something that we've all been taught to do here. Um, you're also able to um, talk about, as I said before, this piece of the energy without having to know about interaction strength. 
That's huge because it's a lot simpler. Um, but it also shows you that not only do you, are you able to connect these different regimes of phase space, but you're also able to show that density functional um, quantities that are true for all different kinds of systems, not just smooth uniform systems, which is what you're often dealing with with high temperature plasmas in the theory part of that, not in real life, but in theory, <laughs> um, a lot of those quantities are for very smoothed out densities. Density functional theory says you can give me any kind of density, whether it's bumpy or freaky in any sort of way, and I can be able to get, I'll be able to give you some energetic information out of it. We're saying that by doing this, you can look at, you can look at these quantities in density functional theory and get back a generalization of things that people have known in plasma physics for a long time. So that's important for connecting uniform and non-uniform systems. Okay, so the time dependence that I talked about before has already been established at zero temperature for quite some time. There's also a finite temperature proof for um, the existence of this one-to-one -one, uh, one -to -one relationship between uh, the time-dependent density and the potential, which is sort of like the time-dependent version of DFT. However, um, in that finite temperature proof, there are certain shortcomings that you can avoid if you just look at linear response, um, which is saying that you're just looking at the first order response to some sort of perturbation. So uh, people use linear response almost all of the time when they're looking at time-dependent versions of DFT, and it allows you to get back like spectra um, from shining lasers on things. You can calculate a lot of that stuff using just linear response, and most people do. Um, in particular, of interest to the labs is um, stopping power, which is talking about um, uh, how uh, an ion, for instance, or an electron travels through um, an interacting medium. So there are people using, um, using time-dependent DFT for that already at various national labs. But what we did is we have a, um, a more consistent version of this proof that allows you to write down the linear response of thermal ensembles. Um, of electrons. We also write down something called the fluctuation dissipation theorem at finite temperature and various other things um, in this paper that starts to write down some of those scaling relationships for time dependent problems as well as time independent problems. So that, that's a formal thing. This is an application in my world. Um, so an application of that work is that you can take the, the response, which is talking about how the density responds to being kicked. So I kick something and it wiggles, right? If I kick the density with like, I don't know, um, an electric field, something like that, um, the density is gonna respond in a characteristic way. That's what this chi represents. Um, and using the scaling relationships that I wrote down before in the thermal connection formula, as well as the fluctuation dissipation theorem, which is what this is, I can get out uh, correlate the correlation free energy exactly just by looking at the response function. Um, uh, of a finite temperature ensemble. Again, we see the temperature integral here, which means that I don't need to know about it at different interaction strengths, which you can imagine if it was complicated before, it's even more complicated now when you have time dependence. And what I can do here is put in approximations to this response function, um, and I can get out new interaction approximations um, for finite temperature DFT with no time dependence in it. Um, and the reason why that happens is because I'm able to write down an integral over the frequency, or a time integral, effectively, and I can get, I can get rid of the time dependence and use that information to inform my temperature independence. Um, and this gives you, again, the same link between finite temperature and infinite temperature that's very helpful for crossing those many phase regimes. So this is how you do it. Um, if you have that last, that last expression is exact as long as you know the exact exchange correlation kernel, which again is just talking about how the density responds to kicks um, from electric fields or other perturbations. If I know that exactly, I get the exact correlation energy out. If instead I say, well, what if it doesn't respond to that? <laughs> what if it's just zero? That's a simple approximation. If I do that, then I get something called the thermal random phase approximation, which is something that we already know a lot about because people use, can derive that in a different way. Um, so we, we are able to verify that we get what we think we get from doing that um, large number of integrals on the other page. If instead what we do is we take the exchange correlation for a uniform gas at finite temperature. So um, 
an infinitely, you know, an infinite space filled with uniform electrons. If I do that at finite temperature, I can parameterize what the exchange correlation, that interaction energy should be. And if I take certain derivatives of that, I can um, plug that in as the kernel, this part up here, this FXC. And if I replace this with this, something that can be parameterized using uh, Monte Carlo techniques, I get something back after doing all those integrals that's an approximate finite temperature exchange correlation free energy that is different than the one that I put in. And that's because of those frequency integrals, even though this is frequency independent. So that's kind of weird. It's an, an analog of a zero temperature technique. Um, but it does give us an entirely new way to approximate exchange correlation at finite temperature. So this is something that's being implemented now, um, not by me, but by one of my collaborators. So I'm going to go quickly through this last part because some of you have seen it before. But um, this is talking about skirting that computational bottleneck um, of the cone sham equations, so these giant um, eigensystem solves that you have to do at finite temperature. If instead we could just get rid of that, and instead of doing all of this to get these um, eigenstates that we have to use to construct the density, and instead just approximate the density and get an approximate en energy out, I could just skip all of that. So as long as this, this, these steps here and these red boxes were cheap, then that would be great. The problem is that then I have two approximations to make instead of one that you normally have to approximate with DFT. Um, so the next slides will show how we have a way where all you have to do is approximate the density, and then you automatically get an approximate energy out without doing a second level of approximation. Um, so this is the idea. It's called potential functional theory. And you can do it at zero temperature. Um, so comparing it to density functional theory, you take some density, you have some relationship, you plug it in to a functional, you get out the ground state energy. With potential functional theory, you took the, the potential, you plug it into a functional, and you get the ground state energy. At finite temperature, you do the same thing and you get out of finite temperature energy. The idea, this basic idea isn't so bad, but here, instead of having um, an approximation for the energy, like you do in DFT, in potential functional theory, you have an approximation for the density. And the reason that works is because we can join the first, uh, the first two steps here of having an exact relationship for the energy functional in terms of the potential with an approximate density approximation in terms of the potential, and so that we automatically generate an energy approximation from just approximating the density. We get no additional approximation on top of it, which makes it highly accurate as long as your density approximation is highly accurate. As long as we can do this for a non-interacting density and piggyback on the exchange correlation approximations of density functional theory, we avoid the eigensystem solve, um, which is the computational problem. Um, we get to leverage the many years of experience with exchange correlation approximations. And um, we get something that's much more computationally um, tractable because we can use non-interacting electrons. And approximating that is much easier than approximating an energy that we don't know the structure of. It's not that much easier. I'm lying. It's actually really hard. But, um, <laughs> but it is easier than uh, the exchange correlation uh, energy functional approximations. So this is the expression. Um, it gives you a free energy, a non-interacting free energy, which is what you would normally get out of cone sham DFT, um, from just doing a coupling constant integral over whatever your density is. So if I know this density, the density in terms of the potential exactly, I get the exact free energy out. So that's awesome. However, I don't know the exact density in terms of the potential, so I'm going to have to approximate this. If I do that, which I've done here in one dimension in an infinitely walled box with bumps at the bottom, so an easy system but a good test bed, um, the exact density, if I drop five electrons in and heat it up to around the Fermi energy, um, the zero temperature density will look like this, and it'll smooth out the black line that you can't even see here. The reason you can't see it is because our approximation is on top of it in red, um, in the dotted lines. And you can see that by using, we used a semi-classical method for approximating the density. And you can see that you get very, very accurate densities, even at higher temperatures here. Um, if we look at how the energy is coming out by plugging it into that exact formulation that we wrote down before, um, we get um, 
and look at its dependence on space. This is an energy density, and you can see again that the red and black lines are right on top of each other, and that means there's no cancellation of errors, as you might see in something that's uh, computationally comparable, Thomas Fermi. Um, there you have some cancellation of errors where it's a little bit too high here, et cetera. Um, so the quantity might be better than it actually is. And you can see here that our, um, our good spatial agreement, the energy density agreement, means that having an accurate density gives you an accurate energy. If you look here, you're looking at the integrated quantities because nobody really cares about energy densities unless they're trying to build things. So this column here is our potential functional approximation. Um, and so if you look here, these are errors. These, th these are 100 times the errors that we would get. Um, and you can compare it to Thomas Fermi over here, um, and you can see that ours is much, much more accurate. Um, and in particular, you want to look at the warm dense matter regime. This lambda value is just a relationship between temperature and Fermi energy. And so if you look about at one, where that lambda value is one, you can see that our potential functional approximation does really, really well compared to Thomas Fermi or the next order correction. And you can also see that if you stretch down to cooler temperatures, like you'd have with traditional condensed matter, and hotter temperatures like you'd have in plasma physics, you also have very good agreement. So this is, this is a really good sign that we're able to connect those disparate regimes of phase space. Um, and so um, there's continuing work in both of these areas. Um, we're currently testing our um, demonstration approximation with different types of potentials to see where it breaks down. And I'm working with a collaborator at UC Berkeley for a new type of density approximation. Um, and there's a lot of other math to be done, like looking at asymptotic analysis of these systems to see if we can use other semi-classical methods to approximate the densities with systems that have classical turning points, like they ooze out past the potential and don't have infinite walls. Um, or in 3D systems even, <laughs> which is what we really need to get to. Um, the, as I said before, a lot of the thermal density functional theory and time-dependent density functional work is being continued by one of my collaborators as well, still at UC Irvine. Um, I'm going to talk really briefly, because um, I'm almost out of time, about some of the work that I did at UC Irvine, uh, working with people about writing their scientific and personal narratives, because that work's been really important to me. Um, this is about, oh, that was cool. That's nice. Um, <laughs> he's really important. Um, <laughs> So uh, anyway, the, these, this is about a third, maybe a fourth of the students that I worked with individually while I was at UC Irvine on writing fellowship applications, but larger than that on figuring out why they do the things that they do with science and why they're motivated the way that they are and what is interesting about their stories personally and to a larger audience. Um, so that was really important work for me because it helped me clarify my own story, but it also helped them become communicators of their science as well as where they came from because I think we have a representation problem in science because we don't always acknowledge why we do the things that we do. Um, and it, it was also very successful for them because these are the, the, of just these ones that I had pictures of, these are the ones that have won some sort of fellowship recognition. Most of them are NSF um, fellowship winners and then some of them uh, have gotten NIH and other, um, other awards. And I'm really proud of them because for a lot of them it was a very hard process because they had just gotten into grad school and I was like, why don't you write for hours every day? You don't have anything else to do, right? But um, they, they really have all put in a lot of work and I think, uh, I think this kind of program is really important for scientists in general. Um, I also got asked a lot of times in the last little bit what my advice to new fellows is. Um, just be bold, be yourself, and ask for what you want and what you need. Um, you don't have to fit into some sort of mold here. This is a very interdisciplinary place and you will find a lot of resources here both personally and professionally that are important. So, um, personal acknowledgments, this is my great-grandma standing up here. Um, my family is pretty amazing. In particular, she's been, um, she's been an inspiration to me since I've known about her, which is only since about my senior year in college. Um, and uh, this is her working, I think, at the State Blood Bank in Vienna in about 1920. Um, she came there when she was a toddler from Semarang, Java. And um, so, having role models like that have been very important to me. Um, and my mother as well, she gave up her scientific pursuits to be a social justice activist and educator. And so she helps keep me grounded um, in balancing all of the work that I care about. Um, and this is my baby <laughs> and my husband who has provided me all the opportunities that I have here because he helps me with my family and 
with this little part of my family that's new. So he's here somewhere um, with the baby. So if you see a bearded guy with the baby, that's who it is. Um, but he's been very, very supportive. So I'm very grateful for all the community that I've had. Um, and I'm also very grateful to all of the community that I've had with you guys because um, I'm not very computational. I don't have cool fluid dynamic stuff going on and videos that I can show. Um, but it's been really wonderful to learn about that stuff from all of you and to feel like I can talk to you about those things when it comes into my purview. Um, so I really appreciate all of the uh, the community that you guys have provided. And of course, I'm very grateful to the Krell Institute and the CSGF in general. So um, thanks very much.